Good evening. I'm a curator of architecture and design at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And like the Silicon Valley Forum, we recognize the importance of Neri Oxman's vision. Um, so at SFMOMA, we seek out visionary artists and designers. We were the first museum to give a solo exhibition to Jackson Pollock, the first museum to give an exhibition to Matthew Barney, to Zaha Hadid, and now we are uh, thrilled to be working with Neri on an upcoming exhibition. So there's no question in my mind that Neri's work will change the discipline of architecture. But I'm also quite certain that it will change science, the construction industry, the environment, and its inhabitants. Um, so a little background on Neri, of course. Um, she, she comes from a small but mighty and very complicated country, Israel, and from a very accomplished family of architects, theorists, writers. Um, so what was she going to add? Uh, she went out and sought science to add to this mix. Um, she has studied uh, medicine, but most uh, importantly, she landed in the US and at MIT, and so for that we're very lucky. I can't really um, speak to her math or check her math, but I do know that uh, one does not receive tenure at MIT without the math and the science and the vision all adding up. Um, so Neri's lab at MIT, which I know she'll tell you more about, is the only one that is led by an architect, and it's called Mediated Matter. In 10 short years, uh, mediated matter has already produced zero waste structural materials. But what is her shortcut? So she really studies nature. It's simple, right? Buckminster Fuller was always championing this quote of people, there are, is no waste in nature. So Neri looks to nature for inspiration, but also really studies it very carefully. And one of Neri's first projects was to find nature's hardest working printer, the silkworm. Then she sought out nature's uh, architect, the honeybee, and how to scale up that architecture. And then looking at one of nature's abundant resources, shrimp shells, um, she has discovered a perfect material that has varying degrees of opacity and transparency. And I know she will tell you exactly her vision for all of these um, materials. Neri is able to really produce, I mean really produce, not just imagine, but really produce stunningly beautiful material that is both structure and skin at the same time. It's a single material. But she has also taken that even further. This material is flexible, and it can change even, uh, as I mentioned before, this transparency and opacity. So imagine it's both structural wall and joint. It's both window and frame. And another thing. <laughs> Neri has genetically designed material with medicinal qualities. So imagine your shelter that is also going to be healing. So we have always spoken, or well, we sometimes speak cautiously about disposable consumer culture, but I think we can maybe envision with Neri's goggles on a world where maybe one day if you have a building designed by Neri with Neri's materials, um, if you want to do a remodel, it's okay because you just take all that material, take it to the compost heap, and print new material um, with this. And so even in the museum world, we know, uh, yes, we all like to go to Rome and see the ruins, but we are all going to have to adjust to this because I think we will see that objects um, are going to become um, something that we need to contend with. And in Neri's world, we are really going to celebrate ideas and concepts, and that will be the legacy that we pass on for generations. So I am thrilled to introduce Neri Oxman. She might be a tiny woman, but she has got huge ideas <laughs> for big change on a massive scale, and I'm really thrilled to introduce this giant visionary. <laughs> Thank you. 
They say that um, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. And I'm an introvert, so I summoned Yoyoma. And if you're hearing me, you can start playing the cello. <laughs> um, what are the products of vision? And was, what is its legacy? And how does it endure from one generation to the next to the next? And what counts as vision? And can vision count if it cannot be counted? And if you had to choose between a Dyson and a Vermeer, which would you choose? If you had to pick between Macintosh and Macbeth, which would you desire? Amazon or the late quartets? The iPhone or King Lear? Which one endures? Edison or Titian? Tesla or Caravaggio? Jobs or Jesus? What might we, the inhabitants of Silicon Valley and otherwise citizen of the world, citizens of the world, including the next Voyager Golden Record, which, by the way, includes spoken greetings in 55 ancient and modern languages, and the song of a whale, and Johnny B. Good, and the sound of a kiss. What might we designers contain within the next message in a bottle that we float into the cosmos? Which of our designs may portray the diversity of nature and equally the diversity of culture on Earth? And can they be heard or perceived by spacefaring civilization in interstellar space or by the future humans, our children, who may find them? Design in all of its forms and expressions and imagery and across scales and applications, design is that life force that is able to connect culture and nature, technology and biology, and to translate innovation into useful and meaningful expressions. I know I speak for my entire team uh, at the Mediated Matter Group when I say that good design can at once fulfill and also transcend its application. That worthy architecture is not only about building a great building, but it's also, through it, questioning the way we live and how do we interact with the natural environment. And it is in that moment of transcendence, of redefinition, of ambiguity, and there's a lot of that ambiguity, it is only then that nature and culture unite through technology. And it's where Dyson meets Vermeer, it's where Apple meets Shakespeare. So when we designed Vespers, a series of biological urns, some of them, death masks that are life masks, we didn't expect that we would be able to, as a result, engineer medicinal compounds to program living matter. The masks' designs led us to their science through the invention of new tools and new technologies, rather than the other way around. Design led to science, rather than science leading to design. And when I asked one of my team members, well, what should we name them, the masks, the vespers? He looked at me with conviction and said, why name them? Let each other, let each viewer, each user create their own interpretation. For one, it is a relic to memorialize their loved ones by way of holding on to their last breath. For another, it is a prosthetic device, a cosmeceutical application, a method for tuning pigmentation of the skin to challenge the imagery of race. With our glass printer, we stumbled across the opportunity of harnessing the structural instability of molten glass and the creation of autocoiled shapes, curly, meandering glass forms 
that act as optical lenses, controlling the reflection and the refraction of light passing through them, contributing to research into glass-printed architectures that may one day harness solar energy. Think Centre Pompidou without functional or formal partitions. Not an assembled machine to live in, but a grown organism to inhabit. The Silk Pavilion, a structure that we spun out with the help of 6,500 silkworms, taught us to think about robotic silk spinning as an alternative to assembly, a bucky dome with no parts. In its most lightweight rendition, mediating the forces of tension and compression. And in our ongoing work on the Ocean Pavilion, an architectural structure made entirely of biodegradable and biocompatible materials that were sourced in the ocean and will one day return to the ocean, we are discovering the alchemy involved in turning a shrimp shell into a tree a structural skin that would, in the future, be able to generate biofuel and contribute to carbon sequestration, slowing marine accumulation of greenhouse gases, which are released by burning, burning fossil fuels, mediating between air and water through hydration-guided self-assembly. Design is a form of mediation. If it is done well, it is like nature. It's very slow, and it's very, very gentle. By mediating between the natural and the artificial, the biological, the synthetic, the genome and the elements, we can, in effect, edit biology and design nature herself. I like to say mother nature, the verb, not the noun as we create designs that combine top-down form generation with bottom-up growth of biological systems. These will, in the near future, enable us to make things that are truly dynamic, products and building parts that can grow and heal and adapt with high degrees of spatial resolution in manufacturing. My team and I at the Mediated Matter Group look for design opportunities where these relationships are entangled. And this is probably why it's so challenging to explain what we do. But we're interested in opportunities where the technique defines the expression, as much as the expression defines the technique. This is, after all, how nature works. The growth of a tree, the formation of a glass sponge, swarm intelligent and the birth of a planet. And when that tight connection exists between method and form, technique and expression, process and product, one can enter the realm of the generative, where design transcends problem solving and becomes a system for thinking about making to tackle any problem from curing malaria to populating Mars. So thank you to the forum, um, and thank you, dear, dear, dear Jennifer, um, for acknowledging me and my team 30,000 miles away, between a valley that is named after a chemical element in Mendeleev's periodic table. That was a good Russian. And our home at the MIT Media Lab on the other coast, and thank you for believing in design, not as a problem-solving practice, but a practice within which to question and to find solutions to problems that we do not yet know exist. Thank you so much.